we asked Patrick Nicosi, the head of markets for Asia Pacific for SWIFT, what he thinks the Asian financial institutions, banks, securities players, and all of the other transaction banking um, users um, will be interested in uh, exploring at, at the SWIFT's annual meeting, Cybos, in Toronto this year. Uh, Patrick, thank you very much for speaking to us. Uh, what are the hot button issues for the Asian member institutions of SWIFT at Cybos in 2011? I would say one of the, the hot topics is uh, internationalization of the renminbi. Uh, that is definitely a topic that some feel is still shrouded in, in, in some mystery. Um, and I think many financial institutions, not only in Asia, but, but actually also in, from Europe and North America, uh, many financial institutions are uh, wondering and, and need to map out what it actually means for them, uh, what it means to the, uh, where the transactions originate, where they declared and settled, what kind of products need to be sold, uh, what customers will require uh, in, in terms of the renminbi products. The, the, the interesting thing with the, the internationalization of the renminbi is it's not a China issue. Uh, it's not even an Asia issue, it's a global issue. Uh, right now, as we speak, on the on the first of June, twenty eleven, uh, we have more than a thousand banks in eighty five countries uh, that use uh, some of our messages with with the currency code CNY, which stands for the renminbi in, in the message. CNY or CNH? Because CNH is the offshore. C CNY. Um, so ISO has one currency code for the Chinese currency, which is CNY. Uh, and how's that being dealt with at the moment? Because then, then does that mean that SWIFT is not going to touch CNH? It, it doesn't mean that SWIFT is not going to touch CNH. Um, the debate is really, do we have one or two currencies? Uh, and it's Technically, a, we have one currency. It's, a, it's an interesting debate. You will have... And we should not have two currencies, <laughs> let's put it that way. You, you, you will have others that argue differently because they will say, well, uh, the offshore renminbi has a different exchange rate, a different yield curve, and therefore it's a separate currency. You will have the other side of the argument, uh, which is that it's only one currency in the end. Well, well, what, the is the, what is the conversation between SWIFT and uh, PBOC? Um, uh, where is that heading in, in terms of the intention of the PBOC? Um, I guess they want the cake and to eat it, meaning they they want the fact that there are you know there's an offshore and onshore currency which is which works very well for the Chinese government. At the same time, I don't think it's in their interest to have uh, two codes out there in the marketplace. The the, the way we look at it is really uh, in terms of, of our customers and our customers are developing uh, offshore and minbi business. Uh, the transaction volumes are growing fast. Uh, and for these transaction volumes to continue to grow and not bring more risks, uh, it needs to happen in a, in a straight through uh, automated way. Uh, so one, one of the, the issues now, which will no, not, not be an issue very long, uh, is market practice. Uh, how do you need to reflect in the exchange of information between an investor uh, and its global custodian, between a and global uh, for corporates that have offshore renminbi accounts, onshore renminbi accounts, is how do you reflect the fact that these, uh, the offshore renminbi and the onshore renminbi um, have different characteristics. Um, and that is a market practice issue that we're tackling. We've, uh, we've formed uh, market practice groups uh, looking, looking at this issue too. The, the goal is very simple, is, is maintain the levels of, of automation and straight through processing that are required as the volumes grow. Yes, maintain uh, automation, but for which um, which uh, currency, for the CNY or CNH, we, we have gone a whole circle and come back. For the renminbi, whether it's onshore and or offshore. Right, um, but what is SWIFT's uh, position in terms of um, which one of the two that you think is more practical to, to serve, give, you know, despite the fact that the ISO has its, its own position in that sense? 
I, I don't think we have a position on which is the more practical to serve um, the the offshore and maybe is in is in Hong Kong and possibly in other financial centers. Uh, the products being built around it, financial products. Is there a way to create a kind of a synthetic um, view of any position using CNY as the base? Yeah, so that, that is one of the, the challenges if, if you could um, in, in managing exposure or, or investments is uh, are you holding offshore when maybe or are you holding onshore when maybe? How do you, for example, value your investments? Um, and that can be handled uh, because in the end it's the same currency. Uh, it can be handled if there's a way to, to define a market practice on how to segregate. If you look three years, five years, ten years down the road, uh, what does it actually mean to the financial industry to have possibly a third reserve currency? Uh, which, which banks will, will be the intermediators uh, for that currency. Uh, how, to, how to strategically prepare for that that shift? Uh, are we talking about simply uh, substitution with the use of the US dollar for the renminbi, or are we talking about growth and new uh, investment opportunities and, and business opportunities? There's also this whole mechanism by which your own member institutions in the Asia Pacific region were at one point very uh, unhappy with SWIFT uh, because they were sort of on the periphery and uh, they were at the receiving end of a lot of the um, European driven cost model in terms of services provided to them. Uh, one would imagine that, that, that um, co those concerns have now been uh, alleviated a lot. Uh, I think that SWIFT uh, is very responsive to uh, Asian needs, to Asian prices, and so on. Um, and today, you find uh, Asian institutions that are becoming uh, more regional and cross-border, and beginning to emulate the global corporate banks that, that um, operate in, in Asia. Um, from that perspective, uh, what do you think are some of the issues that are going to be thrown up on, on, on the SWIFT agenda at Cybos this year? Well, first of all, um, about the cost reduction, uh, it is and it remains a priority to reduce costs. Uh, our, our messaging costs, we have reduced them 50% uh, over the past five years, 50% over the previous five years, and we're looking again uh, at potentially 50% over the next five years. Uh, so, so cost reduction is always a priority uh, and remains so. Um, the, the other uh, angle is uh, about not only reducing the SWIFT costs, uh, the SWIFT invoice, is also about uh, reducing what we call the total cost of ownership for our customers. Uh, we estimate that probably for every cent that is spent on SWIFT messages, uh, our customers spend maybe two, three, or four cents on processing these messages. Uh, and there's significant scope for cost reduction there as well. Uh, and that's where we're looking at, at um, alternative connectivity models, uh, integration solutions, interoperability solutions that can actually bring these costs even much further down. Um, the uh, still on, 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 on the question of, uh, of cost reduction and efficiency, uh, we are moving beyond the pure messaging space and looking at uh, common challenges that our customers have uh, and how to bring cost efficient solutions to the market. One example is around sanctions screening, which is a hugely costly exercise for, for banks to implement. Uh, sanction screening uh, software and, and solutions. Uh, we will be launching at the end of this year a sanctions screening service in the cloud if you want, which would be subscription based. Uh, and it's really geared towards uh, banks doing more or less a thousand or less uh, payments a day, uh, where 
uh, they will have an off-the-shelf, fully integrated with the Swift messaging uh, sanction screen solution. Well, when Swift does that, it's sort of uh, productizing uh, your own delivery mechanism. So while the total cost of ownership goes down by having all these add-ons like sanction screening, um, you, you actually create an excuse for um, incremental cost. But in a way, of course, um, the institution has to think about if they bought it uh, as a standalone uh, solution, uh, that it would cost them even more in, in that sense. Um, would that go well with your clients, with your with your member institutions, to be able to buy this as a packaged solution from so Yeah, it, it, it goes down, I would say, very well, actually, because um, obviously the, the larger financial institutions have already sophisticated, already, do already have sophisticated solutions in place. Um, but for the, the second tier of institutions, this can be a very expensive investment. Uh, and it's not necessarily investing in the software, it's investing in the training, in the integration, in the uh, configuration of these systems, in the maintenance of these systems. Um, and I think the receptions from custom the reception to, to these type of services from customers in the region is, is extremely positive. Um, I would say that um, customers in Asia are probably expecting much more end-to-end -end solutions than probably in Europe or North America. Uh, and a, a, a feeling I have, I'm not sure I can back it up with, with facts, but banks here are busy dealing with the growth. Uh, they see, they're now starting to see transaction business not as a, as a cost, but as a, as a business line. Uh, and as there's tighter region of integration, you mentioned banks, domestic banks becoming regional, uh, regional banks become more global, uh, they need to deal with this expansion and they're looking for uh, solutions that are there, available, reliable uh, and require less investment. Right. Patrick Dikossi, thank you very much for spending time with us. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.